So this, as uh, Dr. Schroeder pointed out, has been a very long-term project of ours. Um, and we're fortunate to bring it to a conclusion at the, at last, at the end of last month. Um, unfortunately, uh, Anna Baliki cannot be with us today, but uh, she shares uh, tremendously in the creation of this project. So we're gonna start, I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to begin the presentation myself, and then we have a segment that uh, Pear will address uh, in a few moments, and then we'll conclude with a slides that Anna would have presented, but I'm, I'll be presenting on, on her behalf. So this map is just an orientation map just to show where is Sikkim in the Himalayas for possibly a few, probably none in this, or in this group, but some perhaps uh, who don't know where Sikkim is located between Bhutan and Nepal. And then the Chumbi Valley which is important in Sikkim history, as we will see uh, in the coming slides. The project began approximately the year 2000 when we were invited by Her Majesty Asha Kesong to work on this project on her behalf. And it was her wish to have a, a modern English translation of the royal history produced to represent what her, her own grandmother wrote with the Togyal back in 1908 or was completed in that time frame. So that's the text that we started with. Um, <clears throat> we also worked with a draft transla translation that was done in the 1909-10 uh, time period by the famous Sikkim scholar, Kazi Dawa Samdu. Uh, the original manuscripts that we worked from were not in very, were very difficult. They were like Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox. And so we had struggled with some uh, and then later on, we got better qual quality manuscripts and the work made faster progress. These manuscripts, both the, what we call the Denjum Gilrup or BGR and the translation by Dawa Samdu that we call HOS as abbreviation, uh, were never finished when they were, when the authors passed away. The Denjum Gilrup, for example, has no title page. And there was no colophon in the conventional sense. It was just unfinished. There are many dates in, internally that were never filled in correctly or completely. Similarly, the history of Sikkim manuscript by Kazi Dawa Samdu has many problems. Uh, there were copies at the British Library and India Office Library in, in London, but um, in, in Xerox form. And when we availed ourselves of those and began comparing to the text of the manuscript in Tibetan, we found many, many differences to the point where our work at least began directly from the Tibetan manuscript and not from Kazi Dalla Samdu's translation. In addition to those manuscripts, we also used royal palace documents from the Sikkim um, archives, as well as the British Library's Endangered Archives manuscripts that are just now becoming available uh, to the public to access. Also, photographs, artwork, maps, text boxes, which we'll explain in a moment, other original Tibetan texts that are cited in the Denjo Gelrup, which we obtained either we had copies ourselves or we made available from the Tibetan Buddhist Resource Center in New York. There's been quite a lot of scholarship on Sikkim by numerous authors, uh, and we've incorporated all of that into our, into our book. I want to focus for a moment on the, um, the manuscript that we worked with. This is the, the principal Denjom Grilrup manuscript. And as you can see, it's written in the Tibetan cursive script, Kuk, and is um, 100, approximately 150 fool's cap size pages of this document with no breaks, no paragraphs, no punctuation mark, just straight text from top to bottom. Uh, so it was very difficult to keep a track of where we were in this manuscript. And um, we, I believe personally that the, when Kazi Dawa Samdu did his translation from a similar earlier version of this manuscript that he, he lost track of his, his place, which accounts for some of his mistakes as we can talk about more. I used colored sticky, sticky markers to 
make sure we kept track and didn't lose, didn't lose or drop any lines. The beginning prayer of this manuscript is in the Ume script, uh, as people are familiar with from Tibetan studies. And this is the version from the Bhutanese cursive called Joyik. Uh, we had a, a Joyik and a cursive uh, version of this text. <coughs> I include this little uh, humor slide. Uh, this is an extract from a biography of the, the infamous Trupa Kunle, who talked about the bad habits of Tibetan scribes and all the mistakes and difficulties that they introduced when they wrote in script, cursive script. I thought every one of these uh, lines is perfectly apt for what we ran into when we did our translation. Kazi Dawa Samduk, uh, again, the famous Sikkimese translator. Uh, he worked uh, not only on Tibetan studies, but he also worked for the British uh, officials in Northern India. And uh, even more famously, perhaps, uh, he teamed up with this American Orientalist, Evans Wentz, producing translations such as the life biography of Milarepa and a number of uh, religious texts. He also did a draft translation of a history of Bhutan, which has also never been published. So this is a page from his original uh, English uh, typescript manuscript. This, this document only became available for the public to use like two years ago. So this is an interesting new revelation that we were able to use in the final stages of our work. So now I'm going to turn the meeting over to Pear, who's going to speak about some of the early slides and early events in the history of Sikkim, how they're shown in our book. Pear? Pear Sorensen. Now, can you hear me now? Everyone hear me? Hear you. Yes, yeah, we hear you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, John, for this introduction. Uh, actually, before I, I, I delve into this topic, I would like to make an overview of the, of the text. You have highlighted it, but I would like to say, at first sight, the text proved to be a very traditional uh, in its thematic structure, and they are organized along similar narratives prevalent in Tibetan Buddhist historiography. Actually, it's also modeling Tibetan historiography along uh, long stretches of it. And uh, it, of course, it's all classical Buddhist topics, at least the first part. Yet at the same time, it, it does uh, raise a number of points and it does deviate from what so far have come to light in the tra this traditional genre by attempting to include mixed literary rubrics, straddling historiography, genealogy, and in, uh, interspersing the narrative with a selected quotation from official archival notions. The works end with a lengthy, as I think John has mentioned it, uh, autobiographical narrative that does seem to show influences, however faint uh, and scant, uh, from Western literature, not least in its candid tone, namely the autobiography style of uh, Yeshe Drama, uh, the, the Queen Consort. Evidently, it, its writing or compilation must have taken years in its making and went through many hands. As said, Jenton uh, Gerup terminates with a lengthy first person and quite outspoken account written, at least dictated, but basically written by the Queen Consort Jesse Driver herself. From beginning to end, the text appears to have changed perspective and format in terms of topoi and content from classical to modern issues, shifting from religious to secular modes of retelling, as well as displaying a marked shift in the language and diction employed. This alone makes the text quite unique, also in the fact that it had been authored either in part or under the active supervision of his drama herself, who clearly was engaged in supervising the entire writing process. Um, again, we should like to highlight that the narrative uh, uh, proceeds in his text, of course, chronologically and linear from the legendary and mythical beginnings until 1908, the year of its compilation. Overall, Dendron uh, Gerab is clearly modeled upon classical Tibetan historiographical and biographical treatises using the traditional Tibetan Buddhist written lingua franca known as Chukhe, at least in the first part. It follows in particular the standard procedure of and the thematic rubrics known from Buddhist treatises and historical texts in Tibet, both in terms of selection of sources, their setup, and 
in particular diction. It is quoted throughout the uh, earlier chapter in the prosimatic mode of Belma, interspersing the narrative prose with verses whenever appropriate using canonical authority citation to provide time tests, uh, arguments and legitimacy to the historical issue. Now, and let me go to the first slide here. Uh, which will be part of my part. It, it is, of course, very important to remember that the most decisive and controversial issue in Benton Gerob is arguably related to this issue, namely the divine and celebrated origin of the Namgyal dynasty itself. The ethnogenetic origin of the ruling house is an issue that is addressed in most royal genealogies, mooted in order to provide the necessary legitimation to the throne. The role of the king Mesa would put the first king on the throne, some of them even themselves coming from noble, landed nobility and even having roots back to the Tibetan kings, which shows that they were uh, acting in that way and try really to copy or imitate in a small way uh, uh, a kingship which were known to them uh, from the Yarong period. And um, the ancestry and ultimate origin of the prospective rule is here in this text duly chronicled uh, and the general get up goes to a considerable length in its fact finding in the area to marshalling a long list of different arguments and textual references to underpin a viable contested ancestry, not least by querying and foregrounding some from others. The most popular outcome is this one, uh, the long debated claim that the progenitor of the dynasty, the first king, um, the first Turkey descended from Kam Minyak. Central to this claim is the, that a member of this loyal, uh, local royal, uh, noble Kam Minyak, uh, came from the line of Ao Dong. But in order to understand that, we have to remember Minyak, of course, is a, a term used, used in Tibetan going back to the Minyak dynasty, the Sishas in northeast. Uh, and it uh, di disappeared in 1227 when Genghis Khan was attacking. Uh, uh, the, the area northeast of the Coconaw, the Blue uh, Lake. And uh, uh, through this di diaspora, many of the Minyak people went down to Kam Minyak in the south, which are quite distant from, uh, from uh, Sisha. Some went to Sakya to settle Tibet and set up their, uh, their new ruling house in Latu Chang in Namring, uh, it's a city. And uh, yeah, we can, keep, we can keep and move to the next one, John. Uh, anyway, the story is that in the 7th to the 9th century, this area of Minyak into the northeast in Amdo were controlled by two uh, proto clans, namely the Dong and the Dong. It sounds like being the same, but it's not. It's Dong and Dong. And Dong actually stayed on in the area after the uh, uh, disappearance of the Yalong dynasty in 1842. And uh, they moved in to get a lot of positions during the uh, coming Sisha uh, dynasty, which ruled from 1980s, 980s until 1227. And they will stay on for the old time. And they moved along also probably to Kamanya, although the, the, the sources for us are, is quite scant to document it. Anyway, uh, one claim and the historical part for the uh, ruler of, uh, of Sikkim came from the Audom. We have a text from the 17th century claiming that, which has it's also quoted extensively uh, in the Gen uh, Gera, and they claim that uh, the, the king of Sikkim came from the Audom family. However, this is the legendary, uh, the historical part. There's another a stream of arguments presenting that they, they are definitely more legendary. Uh, some of them claim that the king came from Muruk Tsenbo, one of the uh, sons of uh, Chisung Desen, uh, claiming that. Uh, he went down to the south, to, actually he was exiled. And uh, he has been used for, as a fountainhead for, for some of the big families in Bhutan, have uh, been used for, uh, for Sikkim. And also actually we know the Dong families, uh, some of them went down to, to Shiapas in, in Nepal, Eastern Nepal, and some went even to the Tamang Takari around uh, uh, Kaligandaki. So this is probably a legend which has been moving around in the border area of Tibet and the fringes of Tibet, and we have problems of identifying the interrelationship between these segments of people coming allegedly from the Dong clan. But this is an interesting topic uh, which has been uh, uh, highlighted in this text very briefly. Again, back to the legendary part, which has been 
the Marshall's as arguments in this text is also the story of Guru Senbo, but also they are quoting and uh, referring to uh, the fifth Dalai Lama in the, in the sense that they are quoting some of the stories that the king of Sikkim actually came from uh, India and was related to Indra, uh, to a, Bata, a pioneer in Bata uh, Yana, king called Indra Bhuti and uh, King Tsa in the, the legendary area of Sahor. But of course, all these stories are again reflected in the fifth Dalai Lama's biography, who himself have Minyak roots uh, uh, in his family, coming from the Changtak rulers, come from Namling in Tsang province. So they're probably, this is evident from the sources, they're probably listing a large number of sources in order to try to, uh, to convince uh, the readership of the divine and a celestial origin of the Namgyal dynasty. So we can move on. We see here, oh, sorry, for the, for the lineage, this is one, the first of, of this is first of in, in all in all five uh, 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 lineage charts we have it become much more detailed later, but we'll see here the beginning, uh, the story of, of the of the Minyak ruler uh, or chief who went from uh, Kaminyak, uh, probably around uh, Tatsido or Kanting. Uh, this the area was was later in the eight, 19th century, 19th century controlled by the Lat, uh, 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 the Lachak uh, rulers until the Chinese invaded uh, Tibet and. Uh, so the Dongs were there, the whole area uh, claim uh, origin from the Dong clan going back to Sisha. Anyway, you see here that uh, one person went, probably in the 15th century, we're not quite sure. He went to central, uh, he went to central Tibet over Sakya with his brothers and eventually came down through a detour uh, to uh, uh, what is now known as Sikkim. And uh, he, was, uh, he was sharing power with a lecture wizard called Tetong Tek Tak, and, um, and that was the beginning of uh, the dynasty. It was born at that period. But of course, the, the Nimapa uh, Tsokchen and, uh, and uh, Katok uh, uh, Nimapa tradition was very important in forging this kingship. So we probably have a combination of, of many things going down uh, in, in this text. What can I say more here? Uh, we should move on now to the next slide. Again, uh, an example of what has been used, especially the first part of the text, of course, the quotation for what, not mainly treasury, I won't go into that. There are, of course, a quotation of treasury texts, the Charmas, but basically it's not a Nayik text, which means a guidebook text. And it's all related to the detection and the opening of Sikkim as a hidden land. Uh, this is where we come into the, uh, we should move on further before we go back to the land of rice. Uh, the Bayou story, of course, is very important, but in, in that term, what happened when Gautam came down around uh, 1380, 82, I think it was, he came down to Sikkim, was, of course, he found a land full of uh, plants, very lush, very uh, beautiful, serene nature, uh, mountains and rivers, and he was inspired by all that, and this is the reason, probably, why the country, the area, uh, was uh, was uh, was denoted Dem Demujong or Demujong or a Kamujong. There is uh, many names to seek him at that point. And the, the crucial thing is that he was as a pioneer, the one opening, and he was of course followed by others, many others who opened up and who has uh, using this guidebook and wrote guidebooks themselves in order to encode and decode. Uh, the area and, uh, and they have different doors, like most of the Pemakur and Kempalung and Sari, uh, all the other uh, um, um, we have in Tibet. And, but for various reasons, Sikkim is of course considered the most prominent among them. And uh, as many other historical narratives in Tibet, they are using prophecies in order to, to uh, highlight this. Uh, Guru Rinpoche, which is the a, a, the key factor in referring to the past for legitimizing uh, the development or the, the finding or the discovery of, of, of uh, Chamas is, of course, the Guru Rinpoche. And in this case also, and we have, of course, access to, and it is affluently quoted in the Jindong Gera, many Nayiks which are all lauding uh, the wonders of Sikkim. Uh, in the sense of uh, why it also comes sometimes called the land of rice, it's of course a, an interesting story. It basically 
referring to the story about uh, that uh, the word J in Tibetan is uh, both uh, standing for salt and also for fruit, which means fruitful plants, which is definitely the original meaning and the basic meaning of Sikkim, the land or the valleys of uh, fruitful uh, plants and trees. This is the meaning. However, even in the 17th century, during the second king, the idea that Sikkim and Jinjong could also mean the land of rice is based on the story. Uh, and it's also reflected in oral tradition in, in Sikkim, uh, that in an area as a field called uh, uh, um, uh, Tang, uh, there is the legend that Guru Rinpoche, during a meal, uh, some corns, the rice corns fell, fell down and miraculously start to grow spontaneously, wondrously. And this is, of course, a very much believed in Sikkim. However, this story is probably a, a mixture uh, and a quotation from Abhidharma Kosha, where we know from the cosmology and the origin of the world that the human being turning up in the world where they were mainly living of spiritual nourishment, but occasionally they start eating more coarse of food. And one of the food was a miraculous rice, which were able to reproduce itself once it was eaten and, and, and thrown into the fields and so on, it would turn up fully ripe the next day. And probably this is part of the legend which explains the, the, the story about Sikkim being, being called the land of rice. But we will have to stay stick to the story that is actually meaning the fruitful valleys. Okay. Thanks, Very good presentation. Uh, so we're going to move on now to uh, some slides that Anna uh, Balecki had produced uh, showing what we call a supplementary material. The, the original Denjong Gilrup, of course, was only a written text. Uh, and uh, even the translation by Kazi Dawasambu is just text. And it doesn't really, you can't visualize Sikkim as a really was just from these texts. So we supplemented uh, our translation with illustrations in the form of photographs, uh, tankas, which I'll talk more about in a moment, watercolors that were painted by visitors, also new maps. We created a series of new maps for Sikkim in the surrounding area, uh, genealogies of influential families from Sikkim, also, some 60 text boxes <clears throat> containing short biographies of leading individuals and other short essays. Uh, as you go through the reading of the history, you find that you have questions about uh, what, who are these people that they're talking about? And what are they, where are they at? Were they uh, fighting these battles with uh, neighboring countries? Or where are they building these monasteries? So we decided to introduce sidebar text boxes to explain that material as we go along. And we'll show you some examples of, uh, of those text boxes as we move through this. Then we also added subheadings to the text itself so that you could follow the narrative because in the Tibetan, it just starts with a topic and then it moves on to another topic with no, with no transition. And so it, it leaves to make to modernize this text, I, I, I guess we would say we introduced uh, many uh, subheadings that will clarify the, these topic transitions. We also converted all of the Tibetan dates into Gregorian versions so that uh, it, it's easier to compare with British and Nepalese and others, other documents of the era. And then we did a set of comprehensive indices uh, to tell you what the Tibetan original forms were versus the, the forms that are written in British documents and by Sikkimese uh, of today. <clears throat> so these are some historic photographs. This happens to be a photograph of the 10th uh, Chogyal, uh, Sikyong Chuku. Uh, I wanted to emphasize that our book only covers uh, people and events that are related to the period of authors of the history. We do not go into modern history whatsoever. And so, Sikyong Chuku was uh, <clears throat> important in his era, was known as a reformer. Um, he began to change some of the ar archaic social traditions of Sikkim into the modern era. 
And uh, the next, this, his successor was Tashi Namgyal, who was the father of the well-known Pildan Tundrup Namgyal, uh, of who was the Chogyal during the 1960s and 70s. So again, these are old studio photographs uh, from that era. Picture of uh, Gangtok on the on the hill. Um, this is these photographs come from all over the uh, the world. They were collected by Anna from numerous uh, museums and libraries uh, globally, as well as from private collections in Sikkim, Bhutan, and elsewhere. <clears throat> so we're trying to illustrate. <clears throat> what's the kin look like as far back as we can go. So this is a picture uh, of Gangtok in the 1900s. And uh, this is from the Joan Schneider Hodges collection. Uh, Enche Monastery on the hill behind. Enche was very important in Sikkim history. So now we have a series of paintings by uh, Walter uh, Hodges and his wife, Ava. They were originally brought to Sikkim in the, in the 1890s, uh, 1880s to assist uh, the, the, the first political officer, John Claude White in engineering activities. Uh, but they took up watercolors or they already were watercolorists. And they did a series of paintings that are quite remarkable. And we don't think they've been published elsewhere until now. So we're showing these. This is the, the first Gangtok Palace destroyed in the 1897 earthquake. Of a, and many, many buildings in Sikkim and India were destroyed in the same earthquake. <clears throat> this is the second Gangtok Palace completed in 1900. Uh, again, by Walter. Uh, Hodges. It also was destroyed by fire in the mid 1920s. Then we have a photograph of the famous Pema Yangtze Monastery. It was one of the earliest of Sikkim history. And uh, we have no, numerous photographs and paintings of this monastery in the book with uh, detailed information on, on its creation and uh, restoration over many years. This is Pensong Monastery, north of Gangtok. <clears throat> this is the monastery that um, the princess of Sikkim, Choni Wumo Dorji, uh, who was the mother of Ashikesong Chodim Wangsuk, uh, where she was originally uh, sent to serve as a, as, a, as a head, as a young girl. She was the daughter of the Chogyal and Gilmo uh, Yeshe Joma. But then she later wanted to lead a more secular life. And so she became famous in, in her own right as a, uh, in many capacities, helping to modernize Sikkim. And then later on, Bhutan. She married uh, Kongzim Ugen Dorje of Bhutan, and they had children. And that's the, that was how the Sikkim and the Bhutan royal families became related to each other. So this is one of the maps that we created for the book. This is a large fold-out map uh, that's in a pocket in the back of the book. And we felt a need for a good new map because all of the old maps were either drawn by the British or other uh, you know, colonial outsiders. And uh, they, they had misidentified place names. Uh, you couldn't make them out. You couldn't read them. Indian place names are written in the by Indian geographers that bear almost no relationship to the actual original names. So we went back to the beginning, starting with the Tibetan names, and then we used the, uh, <clears throat> the transcriptions as adopted it by Sikkimese themselves. And we created this map along with the indices that correlate the, the, the modern versions and the, the uh, the wily Tibetan versions of these all these place names. Every place name mentioned in the in the history of the of the Danjong Gilrum is is shown on this map, including areas outside what are now modern Sikkim. 
This is another uh, example of the genealogies. This happens to be a genealogy of a famous uh, non uh, Chogil clan, the, the Barfum clan. They were very important in Sikkim history. And so we're, I'm just showing this here to show how they were interrelated with the Chogil's families during that period of, this, of several centuries of history. Uh, it's all clarified in the actual book that we've written ourselves. Another text box, this one showing the family of uh, Drakkar Gundan Punzo of the Yangtang Learn. <clears throat> now, an interesting feature of this history of Sikkim is that the ministers uh, are called Learn using the Tibetan title, whereas in the translation by Kazi Dalman Sambuk, they're called Kazi. The original authors, uh, the Chogil and Gyalmo Yeshe Droma, never used the term Kazi. So the idea that there was a Kazi system, I apologize for the noise on the roof. <laughs> The idea that there was a Kazi system in, in Sikkim is really incorrect. There was no Kazi system. And over time, individual families who became closer to the British and wanted to modernize adopted the title Kazi for themselves. But in the Denjong Gilrup, they're called Learn, not Kazi. Um, there's another picture of. Uh, by Walter Hodges. We're trying to illustrate some of the important monuments uh, and monasteries that he painted during his time in Sikkim. These two photographs are old, what they call zone, belonging to the traditional Lepcha and, uh, and Limbu and, and uh, Tlopo families. These are Anasos, these are the only two structures like this that remain in Sikkim because the others more or less all fell down during the uh, rainstorms and earthquakes. So we're fortunate to have these two standing and the history of them is shown in these two photographs. Notice that the background here is in gray. So all of the text boxes are we let me put in gray background but just so you could easily distinguish from what's translation and what is commentary material. Same with this one. This is a text box uh, showing Bhutanese and Lepcha hill forts that surround the Chumbi Valley on the east and west sides, as well as some inside Sikkim itself. Sorry. So you can see, uh, these are very important in the history of, of this area from the 17th century up until the late 19th century when the, all of this land was taken over by the British after 1865. So these are no longer, most of these at least, uh, Damsang and, and Daling are now outside Bhutan and outside Sikkim. But what, what's interesting is that some of these forts were built inside what is today Sikkim by Bhutanese who took over part of Sikkim during that 17th and 18th centuries. This picture shows uh, one of the most important hill forts in the area, this one called Nagri. Uh, Nagri was uh, taken over by Nepal during uh, the 1800s. And in, in 1814, 1816, it was recaptured by the Sikkimese working together with the British. This shows the burning down of Nagri Fort. It also shows the erection of boundary markers because a new boundary pillar was set up to demark the frontier with Nepal. So the Nepalese were the Gorkhas were pushed out of this area and the Sikkimese were granted repossession of Nagri. Today it's in some of the ruins, although there's now a Hindu temple, I understand, where Nagri Fort once existed. And we have to thank Anna for going to these remote parts of Sikkim with her husband and daughter to retake photographs uh, so we can illustrate, for example, all of the three of the photographs on this page were taken by her. Let's see here, where are we? So this page, 
I included to illustrate how we organize the text with subheadings. You see there's a, a subheading that says the Gorkas capture the Sikkim palace of Reptanze. And um, that, that text is not in the original Denjo Gyalra. And there are many subheadings like that that we introduced as it transitions from one topic to another. On the, on the right hand side, you can see an example of where we converted the dates to the Gregorian system using the tables from Dieter Schuh's book, 1973, and also tables produced by the, the uh, Swedish scholar Svante Jensen from the, from the Pupa uh, calendar system. Pear did a text box on royal seals shown here. All of the documents that were in their archives uh, and many that are not were you know, signed with royal seals of different sorts. And when we studied these up close, we had a difficult time reading uh, the actual words. Uh, they were in a, a kind of a Pakpa style script that was borrowed from Tibet. <laughs> However, a pair calls them pseudo Pakpa because in fact, some of the words are non-words. They're just, they're just nonsensical collections of characters. You want to speak to this pair? Yeah. No, no, no. Perfect. It's perfect. Let's okay. continue. All right. So uh, this is just an example of another text box and how we handle some of the second supplementary material. A few words on these paintings that you've seen in the book. In the 1960s, this painter, uh, Rinzing Hladrip Lama, was uh, trained as an art student by a famous Tibetan artist who came through Sikkim. And uh, Rinzing Hadrup Lama's work is so good that uh, he was highly lauded by this Tibetan skilled artist working for uh, Tashi Lumpo, if I remember right. Uh, the the uh, Chogyal Pildan Turndrup Namgyal hired him to paint a series of tankas, of which we show one here illustrating the Denjong Gilra, that is to say the history of Sikkim as written by the Chogil, Tudok Namgil and Geshe Doma. And there are five of these tankas. And as you go around the perimeter, there are these vignette scenes. Each, each one is from the Denjong Gilra. So we saw it as an excellent opportunity to feature his artwork within the book itself uh, with scenes that are related to the text uh, that they illustrated. They're very high quality and very beautiful. And um, we think that this is one of the, the outstanding features of our book. These are rarely seen outside Sikkim. I don't think they've ever been published. Um, and so they're effectively here for an international audience and maybe even many Sikkimese for the first time. Currently they're located in the uh, Namgyal Institute of Technology where they can be viewed, uh, but you have to visit Sikkim obviously to do that. So that's the end of our presentation. We're a little bit early, but uh, we're leaving time for questions and answers. Um, I turn it over to uh, Nika Ann for to co coordinate this part of the presentation.